Mr. Brandt, when did you actually start photographing? Oh, it was in uh, 29. 29. About that time. And did you always knew that you would become a professional photographer? Yes, yes. No, I've, I've never done anything else. No, no. This is always what you wanted to do? Probably, yes. <laughs> yes, it's a very decorative jacket. Mm -hmm. Bill Brandt is regarded as one of the great photographers of this century. A photographer's photographer who has only recently caught the attention of a larger public. An exhibition of his stark portraits drew a large number of visitors, but Brandt himself preferred to see them after the crowds had gone. Bill Brandt was born in 1904 in London. Both parents were of Russian descent and he spent his early years in Germany. In the 20s, he studied in Paris with Man Ray, who was then one of the most advanced photographers. Brandt was attracted by surrealism, a movement which shaped much of his work. In 1931, he settled in England and started to work as a photojournalist. Lawrence Durrell has said, Brandt uses the camera as an extension of the eye, the eye of a poet. Yet this gentle and modest man shakes off all accolades. He has said and written almost nothing about his own work, and his refusal to be drawn into any conversation about his photographs is legendary. Brandt has done for London what Brassin and Ager have done for Paris. The witty pictures of the social life in London during the 30s and the compassionate photographs he took during the Depression produced some of his most memorable images. During the Blitz and the Blackout, he photographed the empty streets of London in a way nobody had ever done before. A poet and an historian, his pictures capture and preserve a world which has disappeared forever. Her book when she was a child. This was Halifax. Fantastic town, absolute extraordinary. A real dream town. I'd never seen anything like it before. I was there recently, fairly recently, but a few years ago, and this is all quite different. There's no railway anymore completely changed. But when we look at this photograph, Mr. Brown, this is an enormously composed photograph, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's, it was lucky to have such a good composition. It, I didn't change anything. It was like this. And the, the boys, when they saw me photographing, they came running towards me. Yes, I was doing um, pictures of the miners in mainly Northumberland. These people were in Northumberland, they were so nice. It was long before the war, of course. I, it had no introductions. I just knocked at the door and asked, may I take some photographs? And they were very friendly and said, oh yes, of course. Do what you like. This too, same. Because at the time they had no bars. They came out of the mines absolutely black. And there his wife washes him. They were all very similar interiors. You know, one room where they cooked and had their meals and all these extraordinary wallpapers, greyish wallpapers. But were you aware that you would produce a social document? Probably, yes. But I'd read quite a lot about the miners. It was at the time of George Orwell and, and Priestley. Priestley. Just a visit uh, written about Northumberland. Do you always know beforehand how a photo will come out, or are you sometimes surprised? I think I more or less know, because I see it in the camera. I mean, I see, see it in, in the reflex camera. I've used a reflex camera, and uh, I can see the picture. I take it when I think it looks right. This was a path near Tower Bridge. But he 
you won't see it, it wasn't taken now. It's not a recent picture. I mean, the, the way they, the, the men look different, don't they? Not just through dress, but through no. attitude. Yes, yes. Even their faces are different. This is, of course, this is a very old one of Escott. I haven't been there for a long time. I don't know whether this still goes on. These are sort of pictures, too, where you're just lucky to find such a couple. <laughs> I just took the pictures. They were so worried about the races, they were watching the races, and they, they, no, they were much too worried to, to take any interest in me. There are two in here which I like very much. Um, the Parliament series. Is it... Is it we made for test? It's really only that. This funny sort of caps and and the other one too is of course even Yes, this one. Terrific uh, character. It was one of those pictures that Again, I didn't really take. This woman has such character. You know, whatever she did, she looked good and right. Anybody could have taken this picture, anybody. But it is a different world, isn't it? From now on, this wouldn't exist anymore. And at the time, it was quite normal. Do you regret the world? No, I <laughs> regret it. <laughs> yeah, I was very lucky, because I was photographing this group, these men, and then suddenly a policeman came, and he looked, of course he looked at me at the camera, and it was just right, it made the picture. Sometimes one has to be lucky. This girl was taken just before the war, and this girl was dancing the Lambeth Walk. I was photographing the, the street and the children, and suddenly she started to dance. Do you think there is a decisive moment for taking a photograph? It sounds like Cartier Bosson. <laughs> But this is something that you would never see anymore nowadays. It was, I think, the very early 30s that you saw these flower women standing at straight corners everywhere with funny hats. And this is also something that you wouldn't see anymore nowadays. The street without cars, no cars parked. This is one of my this was a favorite street in the, it's amongst the, the docks near Tower Bridge. Does it give you a feeling of contributing a bit to history, having all those photographs of places no longer in existence? Is now, of course, it, it makes the pictures more interesting. At the time, I don't think I thought about it at all. But now it's true that they, they have become more interesting. Why do you think people like so much looking at photographs? Is it because people become aware of time passing? I don't know. I think it's just a fashion. It has changed. At the time, people weren't interested in photography. Now, everybody's interested. 
looking at the old photographs, this must be like a sort of diary for you, isn't it? Photographing memories. Yes, it is in a way, yes. Yes, all sorts of memories come back. <laughs> and this, of course, is black art. This is, um, I mean, I don't know whether, whether you were in London during the war, but the, the black art was absolutely fantastically beautiful. No light, no lamp, no electric light, no cars, just moonlight. And it looked so soft. It was so soft. It was like a like a stage. Stage lighting. Very long exposures. Sometimes twenty minutes. But there was no traffic. Nobody took any notice. It was very easy. And this was Liverpool Street Station. People sleeping in the in empty tunnel with all the children. This is a wartime picture taken at Spitalfields Church in the East End. And the man slept every night in this coffin because it was Sheltered. It was never bombed. Do you like looking at your own photographs? I don't do it very much. <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. No. But I don't dislike them. I just don't do it. No. You don't like very much talking about them? No. <laughs> Are there a lot of photographs which never come out that you don't like at all? Oh, yes, I'm sure. Or is it like children? One likes all of one's children. No, not, no, not at all. But they may have to be published even if I don't like them. You know, when they're... when it's a, a magazine wants a picture. And do you, do you arrange a photograph very much beforehand? Well, it depends what it is. Yes. A portrait, I do arrange, of course. Yes. Do you like taking people in their own environment? Oh yes, always. Mm -hmm. I always do, uh, I always uh, photograph them in their own environments. First of all, it makes the picture more interesting. It's not just the portrait, but it's uh, the background. And uh, it shows something of the person. But how does one prevent people from posing? They usually forget after some time, you know. They don't pause for long, don't think. Picasso was so difficult to get in, to take the picture. He didn't want to be photographed. Or he never knew that I was there, I don't know. How did you he persuade him? I, I went about ten times. <laughs> and uh, in the end, I went with some doctors from Antibes who were going to see him to think he'd given them an iron lung, and uh, they wanted to thank him for that, from the Antibes Hospital. But, and I went with them, I went in with them, and they, they were like, slightly suspicious of me, but once I was in the house, I was, everything was all right. Then I photographed Jacqueline, and he, Picasso wasn't up yet, he didn't yet. And when he came down, he asked me, why, why aren't you photographing me? <laughs> and then he was very friendly and when I left he said, oh, do come again if you want to photograph me again. But he didn't, uh, yes, here I said, he, I want you to look serious because he was just laughing all the time. 
and then he, he, he did it just for one picture. He said, no, I can't. I can't look so serious. <laughs> what makes you choose a certain person for a portrait? Is it always an assignment or you decide that you would like to make a photograph of someone? Almost all of these are assignments. Yeah. With Francis Bacon, the difficulty was to do it. I wanted to do it. I had chosen this time the spot where I wanted to photograph him. I wanted him to walk down here. But the light had to be right. It had to be uh, twilight. The sky not absolutely dark, but fairly, so that the lamp was lit already, and he walked down. And he did it very well. You do like uh, people, photograph people when they look serious? Oh, yes. If a picture is meant portrait, if it's a portrait, it's meant to be for a long time, not just for not just a snap for a family album, but for, if it's a real portrait, it must be good still in 20 or 30 years' time, it must still look good. And a laughing picture is it's very irritating you know, to look at for a long time. But sometimes you, your own humor comes into it. For instance, when you photograph the Sitwell, I think you had a little bit of a humor. <laughs> I think I was very intimidated photographing them. Because you're basically a very shy person. Yes, yes. I got on quite well with Edith, but Osbert was difficult somehow. And uh, this Giacometti, he was so sleepy that he said he didn't think he could keep his eye open for very long. <laughs> but to just manage. Jean Arc was very nice, very easy. You were very influenced by the surrealists. Yes, weren't oh, you? yes. Is Magritte. I've always been a great admirer of Magritte. And then I had an assignment for American magazine to photograph him, and we went there on Easter Sunday. And he was really in a hurry to leave, he wanted to go out. His wife was very impatient. She more or less told me, I must do it quickly. And there was an, on the floor was an apple. And I thought this was very important. This apple was, had to be there because he wanted to paint the apple. And, uh, and I will never touch it or went anywhere near it. But then in the end, he, he said, oh, what's that apple doing there? And he just pushed it away. <laughs> Is Graham Greene in his flat in St. James's. It was taken during the war, I think. I photographed him several times. But now he doesn't want to be photographed anymore. I've often seen him in, in Antibes walking around there, but I, I never dared to approach him again. <laughs> well, this was Brack whom I admired very much. And in the summer, he lived in Normandy, near Dieppe, in Varangeville. And we went down to the beach. And in this marvelous light, it was easy to photograph him. He was more accessible than Picasso. Oh, yes, much, yes. <laughs> well, Picasso, well, he was overrun, you know. It wasn't his fault. I mean, too many people. Every day there were people who wanted to see him. <laughs> you take many photographs when you do portraits? I usually take more than 12. I usually take about 24 exposures to be sure to have a good one. In case something happens to the 
first trail. <laughs> This was one of my favourite pictures, this is Glenda Jackson, and she liked it so much. She wrote to me at once, she thought it was, it's what she liked to look like. She hoped she looked like this. Yes, at the time I, I was very interested in Rob Grier, and then I photographed him at his publishers, and the room, was so small that I didn't have enough distance, so I had to take him coming into the room with the door open. Yes, Shiriko wanted to be photographed in his studio, and at the time, as you know, of course, at the end of his life, he painted terrible pictures, never any good pictures anymore. And he wanted to be photographed in front of these pictures. And so I decided, he showed me the studio, and I decided I would get a mirror and hide the paintings, made him look at himself, and you know, just to hide. So I didn't have a mirror, I had to pinch a mirror from the hotel, from my hotel room. I wrapped the mirror up in paper and got it through the port, I didn't notice it. <laughs> and put the mirror up there, and Chico was very interested, but slightly suspicious. I noticed that on many of your portraits, the, the, the sitter is always towards the edge of the photograph. Oh, really? Yes, funny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's true, I didn't... Yes, never in the centre. You never noticed? No, no. Yes. That's Brassa, isn't it? Yes. There is the centre. Yes, there's the centre, yes. Huh. Are there other photographers you admire very much? Well, I do Brassa very much. I think Brassa more than anybody. With this, I was asked by an American magazine to take a self-portrait of myself. And again, I, I, I could only think of a good background. <laughs> and of course, I had to use a mirror. And the mirror had to stand on something here, hidden behind this white chalk. And was uh, taken at my favorite district in the Sussex coast. But this was really very difficult, because I couldn't see what I was doing. Do you think it looks like you, or looked like you at the time? I don't know, I didn't uh, mind about that so much. I wanted to produce a good picture. <laughs> it was just luck. You know, this is very good, isn't it? The shape has come out well. It wasn't as if I had taken it. Mr. Brunt, you always do your own printing, don't you? Oh, yes. It is very important to do one's own painting. Yes, definitely, very important. Yes. Why Cause is... Because I change pictures completely in the dark room. It's really done in... Most of the work is done in the dark room. You favour very much black and white. You do most of your photographs in black and white. Yes. yes. Why is... Why have you made that choice? Because I didn't... I tried color, but it was never any good. This is nudes. It's, it's very difficult to talk about the nudes, because they're really my favorite pictures. 
this is from, this was my first mood. <laughs> a bit uh, inspired by Balthus, whom I then very much admired. Yes, this is one of my favorite nudes. It's like an angre. Yes, a bit. Yes. 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 It was Kenneth Clark said that. <laughs> Peter Ross Pullum, who was then, he was photographer and painter. He told me that, I, say, I, told, I, I said I, I needed a camera with a very wide angle so that I could photograph rooms and, and get the ceilings in. And uh, so he said there is such a camera in Covent Garden. And he told me, and I bought it at once. It was five, for five shillings. I bought it. the most fantastic camera. Uh, when I used it, I discovered that the camera distorted, the lens distorted everything. And uh, I had never planned that, I'd never thought of that. But that's how these pictures, how they distorted, how they, how they're all a bit distorted. It was a camera that produced this effect. I never planned it. I never thought of it. I didn't know what would happen. Yeah. Taken with that camera again. Which, you see, I could go very close to the feet. And so the feet, the girl was hidden. Completely hidden. This was taken during the rain and, and wind. And I was all the time thinking the poor girl, her hair was blowing around and it must have been terribly cold. Technically it was difficult to use the camera outdoors in it because it had no shutter. It was, I had to just expose with my hand again. And to do that out of doors with light, sunlight, it is, it's very difficult. Here it was just with the foot and the pebbles and the rocks. It all looked a bit alike. The, the foot almost looks like a rock. There's a new Sazidi, still my favorite photographs. I love these close-ups like the, the hands, the fingers. It becomes a bit like a sculpture, doesn't it? Abstract sculpture. This, this is very much like a landscape, I think. I think the surrealist would have liked this one very much with the yes. umbrella in the corner. Yes, yes. Yes, it was an old umbrella, very torn. I found it in Holland Park. It was a completely to piece, gone to pieces, so you can see there. The, the nudes were always my favorite, but they were not necessarily very successful, especially in America, the first book, Perspective of New Worlds, was a complete flop. They went, they couldn't sell the book at all. When I took these pictures, nobody wanted them. This, this is the most uh, successful picture. I don't know how many I've sold of this. It's terribly popular. I don't want to say how I took it. I don't want to give secrets away. You never had to go very far for your pictures. You found them almost no. at your doorstep. Yes, yes, yes. I've never been a traveling photographer. 
this was near Marlborough in the, in the winter dawns. It was just uh, against the night, I think. This was a hill and, and uh, it, it was uh, almost raining. I was very fascinated by this. It was such an abstract effect. This is in Kent, near Canterbury. Sometimes it's uh, just luck to find such a thing. This footpath. It was chalk, of course, here. It was so white. This is uh, yes, Hadrian's Wall. You've got a similar sort of effect between this photograph Yes, in a way, yes, yes. Are they many years apart, those two photographs? I don't even remember which one I took first. This is the Isle of Skye. Very lonely place in the evening summer evening in June, when it was still light and, and at about 11 o'clock at night, it was still light. But the birds were terribly excited when they saw me <laughs> coming here. They, they were flying very low over my head. It was quite frightening. <laughs> this is uh, Kew Gardens, um, summer evening. And there was this beautiful bird. There were no people, there was nothing, the bird was there. It was the only picture I took, just one snap. I do ever work instinctively. I don't plan things. This is Avebury, and this was an assignment for a picture post, I think. It was in November, and uh, suddenly the sheep came over the hill. And that, of course, made the picture. Yes, this is also sort of luck sometimes. Sometimes one has, one has to have luck in photography to find such a, to, to be able to take such a picture in twilight on the Yorkshire Moors. Next Wednesday evening, Master Photographers takes a look at the German experimental photographer Andreas Feininger. His use of telescopic lenses produces stunning images and emphasises the unusual in nature. Coming up on SBS in a few moments, the influence of the Norwegian playwright Ibsen on social realism in the modern theatre on all the world's a stage. Mr. Brandt, when did you actually start photographing? Oh, it was in uh, 29. 29. Think, about that time. And did you always knew that you would become a professional photographer? Yes, yes. No, I've, I've never done anything else. No, no. This is always what you wanted to do? 
Aristotle, who was attracted by surrealism, a movement which shaped much of his work. In 1931, he settled in England and started to work as a photojournalist. Lawrence Durrell has said, Brandt uses the camera as an extension of the eye, the eye of a poet. Yet this gentle and modest man shakes off all accolades. He has said and written almost nothing about his own work, and his refusal to be drawn into any conversation about his photographs is legendary. Brandt has done for London what Brassin and Ager have done for Paris. The witty pictures of the social life in London during the 30s and the compassionate photographs he took during the Depression produced some of his most memorable images. During the Blitz and the Blackout, he photographed the empty streets of London in a way nobody had ever done before. A poet and an historian, his pictures capture and preserve a world which has disappeared forever. When she was a child. This was Halifax. Fantastic town, absolute extraordinary. A real dream town. I'd never seen anything like it before. I was there recently, fairly recently, but a few years ago, and this is all quite different. There's no railway anymore. Completely changed. But when we look at this photograph, Mr. Brown, this is an enormously composed photograph, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's, it was lucky to have such a good composition. It, I didn't change anything. It was like this. And the, the boys, when they saw me photographing, they came running towards me. Yes, I was doing them pictures of the miners in Mainly in Northumberland. This would be, yes. It's <laughs> yes, a very decorative jacket. Bill Brandt is regarded as one of the great photographers of this century. A photographer's photographer who has only recently caught the attention of a larger public. An exhibition of his stark portraits drew a large number of visitors. But Brandt himself preferred to see them after the crowds had gone. So, um, no. Bill Brandt was born in 1904 in London. Both parents were of Russian descent and he spent his early years in Germany. In the 20s he studied in Paris with Man Ray, who was then one of the most advanced photographers. In 